In this video is on solving equilibrium problems. Solving equilibrium problems gives you an opportunity to see how the concepts are related and gives you an opportunity to apply your knowledge. Learning how to solve equilibrium problems will help you develop an expertise that may help you in an academic or industrial lab. What you should be able to do after watching this video is use ice tables to solve equilibrium problems. Given initial concentrations and the equilibrium constant, you should be able to calculate the concentrations at equilibrium. And given the initial concentrations and at least one concentration at equilibrium, determine what the equilibrium constant was. Now this is a very simple equilibrium problem. We have n-butane and isobutane. The isobutane is a little bit more stable, so k is greater than 1. And so if at equilibrium, n-butane is 1.0 molar. What is the concentration of the isobutane? And so all I have to do is solve for the isobutane. And so isobutane equals k times n-butane. And so if n-butane is 1, that means isobutane has to be 2.5. If n-butane was 2, then we see that isobutane has to be 5. And so equilibrium constants give you the ratio of products of reactants. Don't tell you exactly how much you have, but just gives you that ratio. You should remember that if k is greater than 1, then you means you have a little bit more products because the products are more stable. The minimum is the most stable configuration, and it's closer to having all products. You should also remember that no matter what's the initial concentrations on this graph, eventually you get to that minimum. Um, you don't know how long it's going to take, but eventually you do get to that minimum. A more complex equilibrium, we have 2NOCl going to 2NO plus Cl2. We're told that initially we have two moles of NOCl2, NOCl placed in one liter flask at equilibrium. There's 0.66 moles per liter of NO. What is K sub C? And so we can make a table. We have initial change equilibrium. We have these concentrations. Now, initially we have two mol molar NOCl. We have 0 NO and 0 Cl2. If we're not told any concentrations for our reactants initially, we assume they're zero. We were told that we had 0.66 molar of the NO, and so that's in our table. And so our table lists all our information that we're given. Now the change is how much is is how much change you got, obviously. And so if 2x of the NOCl um, reacts, you'll form 2x of the NO and you'll form x of the Cl2. And so we have negative signs in front of the reactants and we have positive signs in front of the products. The coefficients come down in front of the x's. And then equilibrium is going to be the initial plus the change. And so we see that 2x equals 0.66. And so we can solve for x. x equals 0.33. And then we can plug in our 0.33 for the other x's. And so we have 2x is, minus 2x is minus 0.66, and the x is 0.33. And again, equilibrium is initial plus a change. And so NOCl at equilibrium is going to be 2 minus 0.66, which gives us 1.34. For the chlorine, it's just going to be 0.33. These tables are very important, so you make sure that you understand these tables. Initial is initial concentration changes. Again, you use x's negative in front of the reactants, positive in front of the products, coefficients go in front of the x's, and then equilibrium is just initial plus the change. And so given the initial concentrations and, and a concentration in equilibrium, we're actually able to determine the equilibrium constant. Now we can plug in these numbers into the equilibrium expression. And so equilibrium expression, we have products of reactants, coefficients become exponents. And so we end up with k sub c of 0.08. Remember, one dealing with just concentrations, our equilibrium constant is called a K sub C. It's a little bit different than thermodynamic K, which is in terms of activities. Now, if we did this thermodynamic K, we'd do it in terms of partial pressures instead of concentrations. And so these numbers in the table now reflect the same as the, con as the concentrations did. And so we have partial pressures. And now, again, if we plug in the values for K, we actually get K is equal to 2. And so our k sub c was 0 0.08, our k is 2. You should remember that k equals k sub c times rt to the delta n, where delta n is number of gas particles products minus number of gas particles reactants. k equals k sub c only when the number of gas particles in the products is equal to the number of gas particles in the reactants. You should also remember that if you're going to use delta g not equals minus rt natural log k, this k is the thermodynamic k. It is not the k sub c. And so you have to use thermodynamic K unless by chance K equals K sub C. And so we have K equals two, so is delta G positive or negative? You should remember K greater than one corresponds to 
product favored, and so that would correspond to delta G negative. You should also remember, you know, should also remember that if delta G is negative, we correspond that we, we call that a spontaneous process. It's not instantaneous, but it means that it occurs without any outside intervention. We could look at a slightly different problem. Here we have um, hydrogen gas plus iodine gas going to 2HI. Our K sub C is given as 55.3. And so given the following initial concentrations, we should be able to determine the equilibrium concentrations. And so say initially we have one mole of the H2, one mole of the I2, zero of the HI. Again, we use the change. And so minus is in front of the reactants, positives in front of the products. Coefficients come down. And so we have minus X for H2, minus X for the I2, plus 2x for the HI. Equilibrium is the initial plus the change. And so for hydrogen, we got one minus x. For iodine, we have one minus x. And for HI, we have two x. And so x is defined as the amount of H of hydrogen gas consumed or iodine gas consumed. Now we can put these expressions into our expression for K sub C. K sub C is again, just products over reactants coefficients become exponents. And so we have 2x, and it's going to be squared, divided by 1 minus x, 1 min times 1 minus x, and it equals to 55.3. Now, often in equilibrium problems, we have to solve for x. And sometimes there's different ways of solving for, for x. And sometimes you have to have some in intuition. And so if we're looking at this problem, if we notice that we have 2x squared on top, and then we actually have 1 minus x squared on the bottom, we could actually just take the square root of both sides. And so taking the square root of both sides, we get 2x divided by 1 minus x equals 7.44. And so multiply both sides by 1 minus x gives us 2x equals 7.44 times the quantity 1 minus x. We multiply that out, and so 2x equals 7.44 minus 7.44x. Um, add 7.44x to both sides, gives 9.44x equals 7.44, divide both sides by 9.44, and we get x equals 0.78. And so now if we just plug in 0.788 for x into our table, or if we just want to round up, say 0.79 for x in our table, and then at equilibrium we end up with 1 minus 0.79 for the hydrogen, which is 0.21. 0.21 for the iodine concentration, and we get 1.58 for the hydrogen iodine concentration. And so we are given the equilibrium constant initial concentrations, and we're able to calculate the concentrations at equilibrium. Kind of cool. A slightly different um, process or slightly different reaction. We're given that the KSP for bismuth triiodide is 7.71 sorry, business iodide, 7.71 times 10 minus 19th, what's the solubility? And so this is actually just an equilibrium problem. Remember, KSP is just an equilibrium constant like any equilibrium constant. And also, please don't get confused, KSP and solubility are different. Um, KSP is a solubility of product, it's an equilibrium constant. Solubility is the maximum amount of stuff that will dissolve in a given amount of liquid. And so we can make our table um, bismuth iodide going to bismuth ions plus three times the iodide ions. Um, initially, we have zero. And so again, our change, we have minus x for the bismuth um, iodide, plus x for the bismuth, and plus three x for the iodide. And so again, the coefficients come down in front of the x. We have negative in front of the reactants, positive in front of the products. And then at equilibrium, we, it's just going to be initial plus a change. And so we have zero plus x gives us x for the bismuth, and zero plus three x gives us three x for the iodide. But again, these tables are essential for doing equilibrium problems. They're often referred to as ICE, um, initial change equilibrium. Um, very, very helpful. Now, typically on, on these tables, we're using concentration or using moles, typically concentration. So the x is in units of moles per liter. Um, typically, reactants lose concentration and products gain concentrations. So that's why we have the negatives in front of the reactants and positives in front of the uh, products. And again, please remember that the corresponding coefficient goes in front of the x. And so there's no coefficient in front of the bismuth. We assume that's just a, a 1. And so that also invisibly goes in front of the x. And so this means that when one mole of iodide dissolves, one mole of bismuth ions is formed, and three moles of the iodide ions are formed. 
the values of equilibrium are, initial to, are equal to initial plus the change. Now, usually we do not keep track of the pure solids or pure liquids because they do not appear in the equilibrium expression. And so now we got our expressions for at equilibrium, and so we need to write down the equilibrium expression. And so again, that's products over reactants, coefficients become exponents. Pure solids and pure liquids do not appear because they have activities of one. And so for the, our reaction, our expression is just bismuth ion concentration times iodine concentration cubed. Again, the bismuth iodide is not uh, included because it's a pure solid. Now the bismuth iodide concentration at equilibrium is x. The iodide concentration at equilibrium is 3x. And so notice that the 3 and the x both get cubed. Okay, so the iodide concentration gets cubed. The iodide concentration is 3x, and so both the 3 and the x get cubed, and so we end up with Ksp equals 27x to the fourth. And so if we plug in our value for Ksp, and we solve for x, and so we divide both sides by 27, take the fourth root, and we get x equals 1.3 times 10 minus 5. And so this is actually the solubility in terms of moles per liter. It's also equal to the bismuth concentration at equilibrium, and three times that is equal to the iodine concentration at equilibrium. But again, please do not get confused between solubility and KSP. KSP is an equilibrium constant. Solubility is the max amount of stuff that will dissolve. Now, it's kind of interesting. There's only four common relationships between solubility and KSP. KSP equals x squared. KSP equals 4x cubed. KSP equals 27x to the fourth. Or KSP equals 108x to the fifth. These are the only four common ones when you're looking at solubility of ionic solids. We can look at something slightly different. And so we can calculate the hydrogen concentration for a weak acid. Acetic acid is a weak acid. Acetic acid is the major ingredient of vinegar. When acetic acid is added to water, it is not completely ionized. It is therefore termed a weak electrolyte or weak acid. And so when we're calculating the hydrogen concentration for a weak acid, we'll use a reaction where we have the acid on reactant and then the hydrogen ion or hydronium ion as a product and then the anion as a product. And so there's actually two ways of writing this reaction. We could have just written acetic acid goes to the hydrogen ion plus acetate ion. That is equivalent to what I wrote there. And so again, when you have weak acid, we have to do an equilibrium problem. So initially, we have 0 0.01 molar of the acetic acid. Uh, initially, we're assuming that we have zero of the hydronium ion and zero of the acetate ion. We have minus x for the change for the acetic acid, plus x for the hydronium ion, plus x for acetate ion. Equilibrium is initial plus the change, 0 0.01 minus x, x, and x. Um, again, this table is very important, so please make sure you're able to use the table. Now again, in equilibrium problems, often the, the goal is to solve for x. Now in this case, x is not solubility, but we still want to solve for x. And so we can plug in our expressions into the expression for the equilibrium constant. Again, products over reactants coefficients become exponents. And so we have x times x gives us x squared divided by 0 0.01 minus x. And that equals our k, which is 1.8 times 10 minus 5. Now if we multiply that out, we get that x squared plus 1.08 times 10 minus 5 x minus 1.8 times 10 minus 7 equals 0. Now we can actually solve for x using the quadratic equation. And so when you have an equation in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, um, x is going to be equal to minus b plus or minus or squared root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Now that plus or minus means you're actually going to have two possible values. One value will be possible, reasonable. One possible value will be unreasonable. And that's how you choose it. And so if we plug in the values that we have, and so our a is 1, our b is 1.8 times 10 minus 5, and our c is negative 1.8 times 10 minus 7. If we multiply that out, we get 4.15 times 10 minus 4th, or negative 4.33 times 10 minus 4th. We can't have a negative concentration, and so our x has to be 4.15 times 10 minus 4th, and so we got the hydrogen ion concentration is 4.15 times 10 minus 4th. Again, in equilibrium problems, often we're trying to solve for x. This is one way of solving for x using the quadratic equation. 
Now, another way of solving for this problem is if you notice that the Eklund constant is pretty small, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5, means that at equilibrium we should have mostly reactants, means that x should be pretty small. And so most likely x is small compared to 0 0.01. And so instead of having 0 0.01 minus x, we'll just get rid of that x and we'll have 0 0.01. Now we're keeping the x for the hydronium ion and for the acetate ion because it's going to be large compared to 0. Again, remember our approximation is point, that x is negligible compared to 0 0.01 because our equilibrium constant is so small. And now what we can do is we can use these values and put those in our equilibrium expression. And so we get x times x gives us x squared divided by 0 0.01. That equals our k. We solve for x, so we get 4.24 4 times 10 minus fourth. Now our approximation was pretty good. Our x is small compared to 0 0.01. Now, if you notice that using our approximation, we got 4.24 times 10 minus fourth, which is actually pretty close to 4.15 times 10 minus fourth. Often when you're dealing with weak acids or weak bases, you can use the approximation. It makes the math a little bit easier, a little bit faster. Um, if you're not sure for whether or not you can use the approximation, you couldn't always use the quadratic equation. Now we could also do an equilibrium problem for a weak base. Ammonia is our typical weak base. Ammonia does not contain the hydroxide ion, but is basic in water. When gaseous ammonia dissolves in water, it reacts with water to form the ammonium and hydroxide ions. However, ammonia is a weak base. The equilibrium forming the hydroxide and ammonium ions lies largely to the left. At any given time, most of the ammonia is in a non-ionized form. But I often think about ammonia as being a typical weak base. You know, it's got, it's got that big lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen, which enables it to rip off a hydrogen ion from water, and that's how the hydroxide ion is produced. And so when you're asked about the hydroxide ion concentration or pH of a weak base, you're always going to use a reaction where you have the base plus water going to hydroxide plus a cation. And it's kind of interesting that it just happens as coincidence that the Kb for ammonia is the same as the Ka for acetic acid. And so for a weak base problem, this is going to be your reaction, water plus the weak base going to hydroxide plus a cation. Again, we'll make our table, initial change equilibrium. And again, change minus in front of the reactants, positives in front of the products. Equilibrium is just going to be initial plus the change. Now our Kb again is very small, 1.8 times 7s5. And so we're going to assume that x is negligible compared to 0 0.01. And so that gives us that. And again, it's because our equilibrium constant is very small. Now we take those values, we plug them in our equilibrium expression. And so we get x times x gives us x squared divided by 0 0.01. Multiply both sides by 0 0.01. We get x squared equals 1.8 times 7 minus 7. Take the square root, we get x equals 4.2 .4, times 7 minus 4. And so hydroxide ion concentration in equilibrium is 4.2 times 10 minus 4. Now notice our approximation was good. When you're making approximations, always check at the end to make sure that they're okay. This approximation was pretty good, and we're able to determine the hydroxide ion concentration. One last equilibrium problem that we'll look at is kind of interesting. And so we could be curious about the pH of pure water. And so we have water going to hydrogen ions plus hydroxide ion. The equilibrium constant for this is Kw. This is the auto-ionization of water. It's probably the most important equilibrium in terms of aqueous acid-base chemistry. No matter what else is in solution, as long as water is a solvent, this equilibrium has to be satisfied. Now for pure water or for any neutral solution, the hydron concentration equals the hydroxide ion concentration. And so we can plug in the hydron concentration into the hydroxide ion concentration and we get Kw equals hydron concentration squared. Now Kw is 10 to minus 14th at 25 degrees Celsius. It is temperature dependent as most equilibrium constants are. And so the hydrogen concentration is equal to the square root of Kw, which is equal to 10 to the minus seventh. Now, if we take the negative log of this, we get that the pH is equal to the minus log of 10 to the minus seventh, which is seven. And so the pH of seven for neutral solutions actually comes from here. You have to be careful remembering that this is only at 25 degrees Celsius because Kw is temperature dependent, but pH of seven for neutral solutions comes from this equilibrium problem. So when you're doing equilibrium problems, please think about the concepts while doing them. Um, I often feel that 
I don't understand something completely unless I can predict or calculate something. Uh, just plugging in numbers to equations is a mindless activity. Ekman problems is much, much more fun than Sudoku. Um, so have fun with them and enjoy.